six, seven, and hop. Welcome to the Life Moves Podcast. I am still Michael Montoya. And I am still Todd Wilson. Uh, we are very excited to talk to today's guest. She is Leanne Sotomayor. She is the Center for the Arts Manager and Dance Discipline Lead at Pima College West in Tucson, Arizona, where Breakout Studios and the Life Moves podcast is based out of. Uh, she's also a member of Breakout's community. I'm sure we're going to hear all about how that came to be. Uh, Todd told me about a, a conversation the two of them had, and it was, uh, you know, right now with COVID, dance communities all over the world have, have been hit hard. Uh, and, um, you know, our community in Tucson, Arizona is no different. Uh, so they, you guys had a very interesting conversation about that. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that before we move forward here? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, welcome. Leanne to our, our little podcast here. I'm so excited to chat with you. Um, you're definitely a rock star breakout member, uh, mostly taking ballet and modern and lyrical, which um, I think I think you have done dance cardio. I remember you popping into a few classes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so we adore you. I, I wanted to have this conversation and brought it up to Michael after we had our chat at the Annex in uh, downtown Tucson. We had a great coffee, uh, tea, chat, um, social distance outdoors, of course. And we just caught up. But what was fascinating to me was how, and I knew this already about you, but how dedicated you are and continue to be to the Pima Dance Program, Pima Arts in general, and how we both discuss the importance of that program having a strong position here in Tucson. And I thought immediately a conversation on this platform, as well as other social media would be great to spread the word because especially now with COVID and uh, the lack of funding in different areas, the lack of support that we have to, we have to bond together and fight. And so I was so delighted to hear your fight and what you're doing. So I don't know if you can just kind of, uh, um, well, I guess we have, throughout the podcast, we'll elaborate more on that, but that's uh, the conversation that really sparked my interest in chatting today. And um, again, just welcome. And um, I don't know if you want to give us a little briefing on how you came to Tucson and, and Pima and Breakout and just introduce yourself. Okay. Well, first, oh. ladies and gentlemen, Leanne Sotomayor. Oh, well, sorry. I thought I thought we already did that. <laughs> I wasn't sure if we had either, but just here's there's a formal one, a formal oh, okay, introduction. Cool. Give it up! Give it up! Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, hi, I'm Leanne Sotomayor, and I um, I just realized today or last night that I've been in Tucson for almost 25 years. So I definitely think I can consider myself a Tucsonan at this point. I, so I actually am originally from upstate New York and I came here via um, Georgia. I went to the University of Georgia and I lived in Atlanta, but I got my, um, my bachelor's in um, dance at the University of Georgia, go dogs. And then I moved to Tucson um, and I moved actually with the intention of starting my own dance company, which was, you know, kind of a big, big dream. I don't know what I was thinking. And then, um, and actually getting my master's degree at, um, in dance at the University of Arizona. And so serendipitously within probably about like two months of moving to Tucson, I actually met um, two women who also wanted to start a dance company. So we did, um, we started, so it was called New Articulations. It ran for about 15 years. I was, um, co-founder, well, I guess I'm still co-founder, but, um, director, um, co-director for 10 years. And then I started having babies and, um, I decided to, to just step aside for a bit. Um, and then, I actually did end up getting my master's at the U of A and um, I'm so um, grateful for that experience. It's like definitely one of the highlights in my life. 
And then um, shortly after I graduated, I got, um, I landed the job here at Pima. I'm actually in the dance studio at, at, um, at West Campus. And I, so I started out um, as the Center for the Arts Manager. And um, uh, I've been here for almost 20 years. So I, I kind of saw that the, the dance um, the dance department grow and develop. It started as like just a few classes in um, the uh, the like the fitness area, and then it moved into performing arts. And then it um, we actually had um, a degree and um, an AA degree for um, for a few years. And, and and so, anyways, I was kind of on the sidelines sidelines for a while, and then um, this uh, I it was May or June. Um, the opportunity to take on the role of dance discipline lead came on, and um, <laughs> I kind of laughed because I'm like, well, I I'm not I didn't really set myself up for like immediate success because of course it's in the middle of a pandemic and so all community colleges are kind of suffering right now and dance programs all over are experiencing some major challenges so i've definitely set myself up for a big challenge but um but it's it's not the first time so um so that's kind of like my history in a nutshell so how long have you uh where did your whole journey with dance began was it as a kid um actually it's funny i i actually was just having this conversation with somebody the other day too i um um i i i think i was probably about like 11 10 or 11 or something and the the um tv show fame mm -hmm. was um was on tv and i was like so in love with Coco. I just, I was like, I want to be Coco. I love her. And so anyways, I was just, I just, I loved the show. I, um, I, so I started like looking at dance and getting excited about dance, but I kind of, I, I remember, this is unfortunate, but I remember seeing um, this show about like ballet in Russia. And I remember they said something like, you know, if you don't start by the time you're eight years old and you don't have like the best, you know, the perfect body for ballet, then like it's really too late. So I kind of had that ingrained in my head for a long time. So I did, so I took dance classes here and there, but I thought, well, I can never really be a dancer because I started too late, even though I was only like, <laughs> I was only like 11 at the time when I saw this. So it was like, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, you're like, oh my God, three years, that's forever. So, um, so I, I was very recreational about it for a while. And, um, and then when I, I did, I remember, you know, um, purposely picking college programs based on if they had a dance program or not, but I wasn't gonna be a dance major. I just wanted to take dance classes. But I, so I started, um, I started out as a psychology major and I actually started, I went to a school in upstate New York, um, way upstate, Potsdam, New York. It was Potsdam College, super cold. I was from upstate New York, but this was like like the tundra. And um, I performed with them. I took dance classes with them. And, um, and then I ended up going to the University of Georgia and still a psychology major, but I was just like, I would walk around, um, you know, I'd look at the dance boards and I'd see like, audition notices and I'd, you know, look at dancers and I'd look at the, um, the classes that were offered. And I just, I really, you know, that was just really where my heart was. So when I, um, so anyways, halfway through my junior year, I was, I was not doing so well in psychology. I was, you know, I was like a kind of a small town kid and like a really big university. And I, I was like, you know, just, it was not really going super well for me at the time. So I was like, told my parents, I was like, you know, I really want to be a dance major. And, you know, being the youngest of four children, they were like, sure, why not? You know, <laughs> they just were like, okay. So, um, was there any other artists or dancers or anything like that in the family 
or was this like kind of out of the blue? This was like my thing. It was like only, it was my, I mean, I think my, my oldest sister had taken like, there's like pictures of her with like tap shoes on when she was like three. But like, other than that, no, this was like solely my thing. And so they were, you know, always like when I was taking classes in high school and um, they were, you know, really supportive and, you know, but it was, again, it was just for me at that time, it was just like recreational. It was just like fun. Um, but yeah, like for some reason they were like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so I did and I auditioned and um, being that I hadn't really, um, I had had some technique, you know, like I, I had been taking classes, but I wasn't like, again, I wasn't super serious. So um, they said, they um, let me into the program provisionally and said, well, you know, we want you to stay like an extra year. Cause again, it was like halfway through my junior year. And I was like, well, yeah, I'll do that, you know. Um, so I I did, and it was it was like it was magical. Like I was it was like I was in my element. I was like a dancer, and I was taking you know dance history and um, and like <clears throat> dance like movement, and I was taking like human anatomy and um, and all of these things that in kinesiology, all of these things that like I hadn't really. Um, been exposed to and I was just it was it was again it was just it was a magical experience I feel like I was really like coming into my own identity but at the same time it was a struggle because I was I you know I was dancing with people who had danced since they were three years old and had been in like you know like 12 nutcrackers and um you, but you know so there was definitely like there was definitely tears involved there was definitely disappointments where um, you know, I'd audition for something and not get in or, or whatever, but, um, but I, you know, I worked really hard and, um, and it, you know, I, I think it set the course for the rest of my life. Like you might start late or you might not be like, you might be kind of like behind everybody, but you just keep working and keep working and, and follow the dream. And I, I think that's what has really committed me to dance at Pima. I, I just feel like it, you know, following my dream really, it just like, again, it set the course for the rest of my, my life. Um, I, I feel like I learned so much, not just about like technique and like how to increase my turnout or like, you know, but like how to be a person in society, like how to consider other people around me and, um, and listen, I mean, as dan you know, dancers, like we have to, when we're dancing together, we have to be on this like nonverbal energy, you know, plane where we're, you know, making decisions without, really being able to like communicate verbally. So, um, and then just, you know. So it's like a flock of birds moving together, you know, and, and yeah. No, yeah, you're, you're making Sorry, decisions. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, you have to make decisions on stage um, where like maybe your partner, uh, you know, was late to, you know, on their, on their cue and you have to like make that still work out. So, and then just that dedication and like walking into a space. I remember a teacher saying like, when you walk into the dance studio, you leave everything else behind. You leave your chemistry class and you leave your history class and you leave your boyfriend and you leave everything out. And so it's really like that opportunity to sometimes like if you're having a bad day, to, to walk into the studio and like not have to bring that with you and be able to separate those parts of your life. Um, and I think we take that into the workforce as well. Like how do we, um, of course, if like my colleagues like are listening or whatever, they'll probably be like, oh, Leanne's an open book. You know, she talks about everything. But for the most part, I, you know, I can, I've learned how to separate these different these different areas and, and be able to focus on like what what's at hand at the time. So you were started dancing as a as a kid, but it didn't really connect with you 
until college it wasn't until so were you dancing consistently that whole time just recreationally as for fun yep yeah i was um i started i really i think i i started like i took my first ballet class in like sixth grade and then um and then like took a couple years off um i don't remember why i think it was like it wasn't like really cool um <laughs> i don't know um or my friends weren't i don't know i don't remember but <clears throat> then I started um, dancing, uh, like taking classes in high school at a, at a small studio. And, like we did, you know, annual recitals and had the costumes and all. But um, and then and actually one and I, I still had that like, OK, maybe, maybe this is it. And I remember taking like a really intensive ballet um, class or like a like a month long intensive at um, a serious ballet studio and I was like older like I was like I think I was a junior like it was after my junior year in high school and I was like older and the other kids were like the other students were like middle school students and I was like I just felt like you know the big like clumsy <laughs> <laughs> and I remember like even you know, I just didn't, I didn't know, like the, I just didn't know the etiquette. I, I feel like there was, I remember, <clears throat> I think, okay, I, I don't know. I, this is kind of a funny story. I probably shouldn't say it, but like, I like, you know, like when we wear our leotards, we don't wear underwear under them. Like that is like our underwear kind of. And, um, and I remember having like, <laughs> like wearing my underwear and it was like sticking out. And I think like, <laughs> I think one of like, I remember like this sixth grader, like probably like pointing and laughing, you know, like things like that. We all come into that situation um, where we, we, we don't really know the rules yet. And so it was just it felt like this big clod hopper. Um, but at the same time, I remember like watching my ballet teacher and just being like, oh, like, oh my God, she's so beautiful. And I still remember like why I was like standing, she was like right in front of me at the bar demonstrating and she was doing an, a rond de jambe on Lair and like her leg, the way like her leg went from like en avant, I think to like the front and it, it rotated around and how like it turned in the hip socket and like came around to the front. And I was just like, oh my God like those little intricacies and that's why I love ballet so much it's like there's there's like these little intricacies that unless you've taken a ballet class you really you don't know like you don't know like the whole you know it's just like sculpting the body and like all these little teeny things that yeah. that make a huge difference so that was probably my mo the most serious I'd been in high school and it was that class. And I didn't, like, I didn't continue with that studio. I think I just felt like a little bit like, oh, like I'm, you know, like the, the big kid, you know, like. <laughs> oh, just, just, so you, you definitely, you had uh, an appreciation obviously for that. Because if, if you're looking at all these small intricacies and all that stuff, there's definitely an appreciation obviously for it. I was just curious as to what uh, kept you, because when you're talking ballet, and these disciplines that are, you know, incredibly uh, you know, disciplined and takes a lot to, you know, a lot of commitment because I backtracking a little bit on the last podcast we did, we were talking a little bit about uh, what you had talked about, uh, the, the assumption of, well, if you don't start at a certain age, may as well, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, because you know, I, I remember hearing that too. You hear that all all the time, especially with ballet, especially with you know these certain types of dances. Uh, but the last person, Joshua Blake Carter, that we were talking to, didn't get started until he was in high school. There's a lot of people that you know that we know and talk to that really don't get started until a little bit later, and uh, so that always fascinates me. But also dancing from the age of eight and then you know all the way through college uh so you know the, your your appreciation for that was it must have kept you around that whole time but then uh, you know when you're in college you're saying is when it truly clicked right it's like this is how it 
pertains to me in my life. This is how I use this tool. This is how, you know, this is what this sword is for that's been on my back all these years. Um, and then parenthood, you said, comes around. And then uh, I know when I became a parent, I, it completely made me reevaluate my relationship and connection with dance. Um, uh, was that the same for you? Because I remember you saying that that was a, a kind of a, a little of a bit of a of a break breaking point, for you, right? Yeah, it was. Um, it was. It was really hard because I had decided that um, I had to like shift my identity a little bit and I it, at the time I had my son who's my first my first child and he's um he's he's a teenager now he's 13 and I I realized like something had to give and I had this I had this dance company but at the same time I was working a full-time job and I didn't I didn't want to take any more time away from my son and I, I was gonna end up just, like I could have stayed on as the director, but I would have just been like writing grants and you know doing the administrative stuff. And that wasn't enough to hold, like I need, I still needed to be dancing in order to be fully invested. So I, I decided it was time like for me to step aside. And at the time, um, Tammy Rosen, who was the other co-director and she also teaches for Breakout, she had already stepped aside because she had a, a she had her daughter like two years before, um, and so I you know I just thought that that was the right thing to do, and I wanted to see if you know would somebody else be able to take this on and and really like take that passion forward because at that point I just wasn't I wasn't fully passionate. But when I did when I so when I did resign, I felt like this loss like who am I? And people would ask me, and of course I had a, still had baby brain at the time, but people would be like, so what do you do? And I would just like, I didn't know. <laughs> it was just like, it was just like a blank. Like I, I, and I've, you know, I'm, I've always been invested in my job as center for the arts manager, but it's administrative. So it was, so there's not as much creativity involved. Um, so it's, it's, it's me like support, Supporting other people and their creative efforts and that is you know that's that's a huge um uh that's a it is a, it's a it's a return on investment or whatever because I see I get to be part of everybody's like creativity and and I love it but it wasn't quite you know it wasn't quite enough I, at the time like I didn't just didn't feel that like it's a part of my, like my my flame had like been extinguished, so that was really hard. Um, and I still I was still able to dance a couple times. I remember actually, I had my daughter <clears throat> three years later, and Tammy Rosen like she was with, we were both still involved with new articulations, but um, but just not administratively. And I was dancing like here and there, but she had me do this this choreography at like. It was like right after I had my daughter. And I <laughs> just like remember like there was like some ab work in it and like be like, oh my God. But um yeah, so I but for the most part I stepped aside and then um I really I you know I really wanted to get back involved and like how can I dance when I have two kids and my husband works um he's a chef and so he works weird hours and um so basically I would have to bring my kids with me and sometimes that was that was challenging but I you know it was it was funny like we were I was taking a modern dance class at Zuzi and um with Tammy and then for some reason our class was can't was going to be canceled like one night so we were like well where where can we take class so somebody's like well breakout studios and so that's all she wrote I like I discovered breakout studios and like all of these classes and there was like adults and everybody was accepting and warm and, um, and inviting. And I was like, oh my God, this is my place. And so, oh my gosh, I was, it was, it was great. And then sometimes I did 
bring my kids and there was like one time that they like both ran through like they did this it was when the when the studio was on fourth avenue and there was like a yoga studio in back or something and they were like chasing each other around and i'm like oh my god these are my kids but um yeah so it was it was just great you know i i really felt like this is like a place for me and it was i always joke it's um it's my church and what ballet there's a ballet class or there was like, you know, for years I was going to this ballet class on Sundays and I'm like, this is my church. Like it fulfills like my spiritual wellness, my like physical wellness, my social wellness, like all of these, you know, intellectual. So it was like, this is like my perfect practice here. We talked about accessibility and support. The last time when we first talked, we talked about the importance of accessibility and support within communities and, and have so that's pretty awesome. And uh, now a lot of that accessibility and support is uh, in jeopardy all over the place because of uh, now what we're facing uh, with the pandemic and everything. Uh, uh, what are, uh, what are, what are the, uh, some things you're facing with the pandemic with people right now? Yeah, well, it's... Um... It's a challenge. I, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, we, you know, in terms of the dance program, um, I have to say there's a lot, there's a lot, like it, it didn't, it, it there, like Pimo has gone through a lot of changes and enrollment has been going down for years, like the last few years. It's, it's not just Pima. It's a, it's a, um, it's a nationwide thing that's happening. And, um, at, at one point, like when in um, the late 2000 whatevers, um, when we had the how the housing market crash and people were losing their jobs, um, at that point, like our enrollment soared. I mean, like we were like, mm -hmm. it was amazing. So, and that was the time that we started the dance program, like around the same time, and it was doing really well. And then, you know, once. The economy started coming back and this is and this is something that's not uncommon with the you know community college um people started getting jobs and less people were coming to school so um so we saw that decline in enrollment and um we weren't able we had a full-time dance instructor and she was um she was phenomenal um really great and then when she left we weren't able to hire another full-time person so we've been running with adjuncts and which they, they've always been great and, and highly committed, but that there wasn't that attention. There wasn't like that full-time person to really like be able to step into the dance program. And, and, you know, when you're in at, like our adjuncts at Pima, we run on adjuncts and they're amazing, but they're also like, it's not their full-time job. They have a lot, they may have another like full-time job, you know, and that's, that's kind of the, the role of community colleges. We want professionals that are coming in and teaching our classes. So, um, so anyways, the dance program just, it was not getting the attention it needed. And so, and that was really frustrating for me because we have this beautiful studio and, um, and of course I just have a commitment to dance. And so I really wanted that to, I wanted to change that. And so, um, but at the same time, we like went into the pandemic. And so there was a lot of, not only were we not getting exposure as like, I, I think a lot of people don't even know we have a dance program. We didn't have a lot of like recruitment efforts. So that, that was a problem. And then, um, and then the pan, with the pandemic, so being that people maybe didn't know that we had a dance program and and then being like socially isolated, it was hard to really communicate that. People didn't know if we were gonna have um, in, in studio classes and, and it's hard. I mean, we, it's hard to, I mean, a lot of dance, for dance, it's, I didn't realize how like social it was for me, you know, like it's being like with, I mean, we, when, as a dancer, you, a lot of it happens through like osmosis where you're watching other dances, you're dancers, you're physically, you know, so that's a huge part. So I think that was, people weren't really, didn't want to make that investment. Like if they were going to, you know, be taking from their living rooms or whatever. But my, my boss, um, who's the Dean of um, the arts at Pima, 
he was like, no, we're going to bring people in. He was like, we're going to do it. We're going to be safe. We're, and so he worked really hard to develop this plan so that our, our arts classes, not necessarily like the lecture classes, those can be done virtually, but you know, any of like the lab, like dance and theater and, um, and like, you know, sculpture, things like that. They, he was like, we're going to bring people in. So we, we developed this plan. He worked really hard and we were able to get people to come in. So it was like this, not that you care, not that, that it's, you guys really care, but they were able, but students were able to come in once every two weeks with this plan. That was last semester. It worked, you know, it worked well, but it still wasn't a lot. Um, so this semester we're able to, um, they're able to come in for the most part once a week, but with dance, because our program is so small right now, they're able to come in every day or like the classes meet twice a week, but they're able to come to every class because we, it's like a, the amount of people is, a, we're, we're able to be socially distanced. So that's kind of a benefit right now. And um, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought for there. Did I, <laughs> for a second, <laughs> oh, what, what are the challenges? So yeah, um, the other challenge is that, um, like, how do we, you know, a big challenge was like, okay, like how do we create dance and share dance when we can't bring people into the theater? Like we, how is that? Like, how do we do that? So now me, I am like a like annoying, optimistic, per, annoyingly optimistic person. So sometimes I see these like barriers as challenges, like creative challenges, artistic challenges. So I'm like, well, we can do this or like, we'll do this or we'll explore this. Um, and not everybody is, feels the same way. You know, it's not, that's just, and, and some people will say like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty annoying. Like Leanne, just shut up. Like, this is a problem. Just, you know, let us be upset about it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we, um, so we ended up like, in terms of like performing arts at Pima in general, um, some people were really creative. Um, we, we all kind of learned how to record and edit videos. Um, there was, I definitely learned a lot, um, I, I, but I mean, I still have a lot to learn, but um, you know, like we're learning. So we kind of, we kind of upskilled in a way. Um, and our dance, um, our dance program, they ended up have, they did actually, they did a show on stage, but it was all recorded. And, but at the same time, like the dancers learned, they were responsible for, um, we recorded their video, but they were responsible for editing it, editing it. So they, they learned something. So it's, and I'm excited because I think like dance on film, like we can be creating for, for film more often and, and putting dance out there, like dance, getting dance exposed. So that's, and then this semester, our dance ensemble um, is, they're going to, we have, um, we're gonna, they're each, each dancer is gonna be able to um, uh, like create their own mini show and they can do it like at different locations um, so they're going to get a lot, each student is going to get a lot of attention and, um, and hopefully we'll be, ex well, we will be exposing each of these, like their creations. And my plan is to actually document the process and put that out there as well. So we know like who these students are, like what they're going through, um, what they want to explore. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. That's really yes. cool. Sorry, um, sometimes when we're forced to think outside the box, it pushes us to be the most creative. And there's so many creative workshops and exercises where part of it is to take away supplies, mm -hmm. take away music, take away uh, props and, and say, okay, you have these very limited things. Now, what can you create with these things and how can you push your boundaries? So maybe... That is a uh, perk of the madness right now is that people are forced to be creative and then also forced, like you said, you be 
learning new things and editing and video and how cool is it that you are in a facility where there's a you know a college or a a uh, department that's so great and that you can go to and say hey I want to learn something new <laughs> it's pretty cool oh my gosh it's it's amazing I mean we have we have so many resources here at Pima um, and I have a film student that's interested in working with the dancers. So I, I'm just excited, but I will, you were saying about like stripping away different elements to be more creative. Well, um, Nolan Kubota, who is our, he's, he's the director of our, our dance ensemble. And, um, there was like questions, you know, everybody was trying to figure things out at the beginning of the pandemic. And we all of a sudden were like, okay, we realized that Pima's licensing, music licensing doesn't include streaming rights. Mm. So, and I think everybody was kind of faced with that. So, um, but we didn't really know, we weren't really sure right away. Explain what that means. Uh, Pima licensing did not include streaming rights. What do you mean by that? So, so our licensing at Pima, we can, we can use uh, music in the, like the ASCAP BMI world, but we are not allowed to um, like record a, a performance piece with that music and then put it out on like YouTube. Gotcha. And just for people who are listening, who may dance, that may not be a teacher at the moment, that is something teachers since the pandemic has has had to face on top of everything else i mean being restricted with what they used to teach of copyright issues so you're saying that pima college even has to worry about that wow that's well there you go there's another challenge for you i guess yeah so um so it was it was kind of like shocking, I think, at first. And um, Nolan decided, well, you know what? We're gonna do we're gonna do a silent show. So I was like, okay. So um, so actually, the show was called Silence. And the so the the um, the choreography was recorded with music. So there was still that inspiration. Dancers were, you know, had that song that when they were dancing, it was recorded, but we stripped it out when we, we put it out. But we had, but we kind of wanted to make like a little game out of it. So, um, so we told people, so we gave them kind of a suggested playlist. Um, well, like, yeah, a suggested playlist. We had to be careful because we couldn't like say, well, this song belongs with this. Cause there was, we didn't really know if that was, if that would be, a, you know, um, if that would be appropriate in terms of our licensing. So we gave people a suggested playlist and they could play it, you know, along with the piece um, or they could put the dance to their own music and see like, so what, you know, what, what happens with that? Like, what does that look like? And I don't know how, you know, creative people were like our audience was when they were watching it. Like if they're like, hmm, maybe I'll put this to my own favorite song, but, um, but it's always kind of fun to like experiment with, you know, create something to one piece of music and then like either dance it to like a completely different tempo and like how does it change and or how does it change visually. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, yeah, so that's what that was his kind of like creative, like, you know, barrier or whatever, creative challenge. Yeah. Um. I think that uh, it's really interesting how how a lot of dancers, because it's already, before the pandemic happened, I feel like dancers were already gravitating towards filmmaking. Just mm -hmm. because we are socially, uh, it was social media, I mean, everything's all about capturing the raw. Like your average Joe who doesn't know, you know, know anything about any whatever will get a relatively general understanding of framing and composition or lighting or things that, you know, people didn't even think about. I mean, go again, going back to having kids, <clears throat> there used to be a day and age where somebody would say, well, I remember when I was a little kid and I'd see the people on TV and I think to myself, well, how did those people get in that little box there? Well, how did they get those people to get big and in that little box, you know? Oh. 
and it's like ha 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 oh yeah the, you know the the wonders the innocence of being a child but now before a child could speak this child has you know could comprehend what it is to get footage and to review that footage before a child could talk a child could see you taking a picture with your phone and then lean because they want to see it they want to review footage they understand this concept of getting footage reviewing it and getting a shot you know which opens the doors to a whole other oprah but in terms of filmmaking now we're at a place where whether it's TikTok, whether it's just youtube in general everybody's walking around with a film studio in their pocket and uh, editing equipment, every, everything you need, you know? And you see how creative people are getting, incorporating these elements into dance. And it's a completely different thing. I mean, you could have a great, con uh, a great understanding of choreography, of stage, of staging uh, and, and transitions. But if you don't have an understanding of how to of framing and composition within film, within that kind of frame, and within the editing, the pacing, and all that, you could lose it. You could lose all that choreography and lose a, an effect or lose a sense of timing. That it's a whole other rhythm. Um, I, and I'm, I think that, I think that after the pandemic, this element of filmmaking is just going to start to really. You're going to see a lot more because, yeah, I think that it's really forced a lot of people to really explore that more than they probably would have. Just like virtual teaching before the pandemic, if somebody tried to incorporate this in their studio, it's like, why? Why are you doing that? But now, when it's all said and done, I don't know if a lot of places are going to want to lose that element of it because of, you know, what they've been able to build with it for almost a year now. Uh, what what are some things that you've noticed or that you think that dance, the dance community, dancers may adopt moving forward after the pandemic? Yeah, I think um, I definitely agree. Like the film, I and mean, we, we, again, we already, we've been seeing dance on film. Um, I know that the um, ASU has a program um, and they they tend to be very innovative, um, but I feel like it it just probably started to catch on. I mean, like not everybody was doing it, like not everybody felt comfortable with it. Um, but the you know we were kind of like going up that slope, and then we came into the pandemic, and we were like pushed over. So um, I definitely think that will be something that we. We, we definitely see more of for sure. And that, you know, one of the things that like was really always challenging for me as a choreographer is um, like, I had to get a studio space. I had to get my dancers like in the space. Um, like I, I could, you know, kind of create movement on my own, but in like, I had to see it, I had to have the dancers. But now with the, like with this, you know, being forced over the edge of like film, I was um, like, one of the things like when we first went into pandemic, like my center for the arts staff, we're like, what do we do? Like, wh what are we, what are we supposed to do? We wanted to be doing something meaningful. So I was like, let's, let's do, I can't remember what they're called now, but um, like creative hours or something. I got, I stole it from um, my daughter's teacher and a lot of in like in high tech industries, they, you know, they're incorporating these creative hours that where like their employees can take an hour and just like explore whatever they wanted. So I was like, let's do that. Let's have these creative hours. So I really started to, um, and it was probably more selfish. Like it was like, <laughs> I need to be creative right now. So I was really exploring like dance and film and like my, with my own, like how, what happens if I go under this piece of furniture and like, what kind of what can I what what can I get out of that? What is how is that going to look? What if I go into this corner? What if I like move with this lamp, um, or like outside, or I put different effects on things, or I slow it down? So that was that was really really it was I I kind of feel like it gave like helped me survive the pandemic because I felt like I was doing something meaningful and I was learning new stuff. And so it was, it was almost like a sabbatical um, 
where we just kind of like stop and then we discover something new. So I imagine, and I know actually that like a lot of people are doing this and even with like TikTok, like it's easy. My daughter is, she's 10 and she's constantly creating like videos on TikTok and experience, experience, experimenting with like the different um, filters. And I don't even know how to do that yet. I've just been working with my iPhone. But there's a lot. So I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see this movement and film and, and be able to create these different, you know, taking dance off of the stage. Of course, we want to keep it on the stage when we, when we're able to, but explore where else we can dance. What about you, Todd? What do you think, uh, what do you think dance dancers are going to hold on to after the pandemic? Do you see any anything growing from this in that respect? What's funny is I, I had lunch yesterday with someone and she said to me, she's a breakout person. She said, Todd, why is it breakout on TikTok? Huh. <laughs> in like a very serious way. I'm like, because I can't handle one more platform. That's probably why. And that's a bad excuse, but you know, that's like the next step is to, uh, to take on that platform, you know, Breakout's YouTube page before the pandemic was a, a creative space of no regulation or rule or path. It was just a place where we uploaded videos. You know, there was even a video I created where I just had to, I had something to say about work ethic and I just kind of made a video about that and put it out there. And, and then for a while we actually had a class, a production class. It was, a, it was one hour once a week and it was the craziest thing because we would choreograph, uh, shoot something and talk about post all within an hour and create these videos. It was madness, but some of them are really amazing. The one, Michael, you did the Star Wars one in the, <laughs> I'll post it. I think it's one of the best videos on YouTube. I will say that <laughs> to my dying day. The fact that it's not viral is a shock. Maybe we should put it on TikTok. That's what yeah. we should do. It's crazy. It's just stuff like that. You know, we were kind of playing early on and now with these platforms, it's become a financial necessity. It's become a, a emotional and spiritual necessity um, for people to access these things and to be a part of community. And, you know, we find a way. That's one thing nice about humans is that if we have a desire or a need that is great enough, we will find a way to solve that problem. And we've got these platforms and these devices now. I mean, the fact that, you know, we can shoot 4K cinema quality freaking videos on our phones is crazy. Um, you know, we've been trying to watch old videos at the Wilson household, many of which include Michael. And we're trying to like, we had to buy a special VHS play, which was like three hundred dollars on Amazon because you can't buy them anymore. So, the takeaway would be adaptability, um, entrepreneurship. You know, developing their own platforms and websites. And you know, I had a friend recently ask me about. Well, I want to get into the fitness genre online and do live classes. What do you think? I said, well. I would have answered this completely different a year ago. I would have said, go, there's not a lot, not really good quality, do it. Now I still feel the same way, but I mean, Apple's in it. Every major uh, athletic wear has their videos now. Every major studio, every major gym has online class. I mean, everyone has online classes now. That isn't to discourage anyone, but that's not the case a year ago. I mean, it was, instantaneous and that's part of industry power of uh what this pandemic has made us do so yeah intuity and yeah the tiktok thing i'm almost intimidated by it. it's like there's some really serious folks on there <laughs> serious and i guess so i think uh i'll oh piggyback on um on something you just talked about and i just it just slipped my mind it's happening again. um i mean you're talking what were you just saying right before you said the tiktok the very last thing you said you distracted me with the uh, 
the ingenuity and uh oh, oh, oh. that's what okay okay how how a year ago you would have recommended something to somebody because it was an open plane or it was an open field of nothingness and now it's just like Apple, every major company, everybody has a, a, some kind of a this, a class of whatever you name it on there. What I've noticed is uh, I hear a lot of people talking about, again, as a result of the pandemic, people who didn't spend that much time watching online content, YouTube channels, these types of deal, all of a sudden, have found their way to these different things. People who, uh, because at a certain point, all the network stuff, all that stuff, I mean, they kind of fell behind. There was really nothing there and people started looking elsewhere for things and, uh, you know, as out, outwards of, of Netflix. Um, when a lot of the late night platforms had to move to, you know, to a YouTube channel platform uh, the Jimmy Kimmel's, the Jimmy Fallon's, you name it, that have to, you know, do what we're doing right now. And they're, they didn't really adjust the format of what they do. They were just talking to somebody, yeah, you're talking to a camera just like this out of their house. They tell a written joke and they would kind of pause still for laugh breaks and it's just silence. And you're like, eee, this is, uh, this looks bad. And it looks, and it just feels off because we have an ocean of YouTubers that are well rehearsed and suited up and ready to play. And this is what they do. They're the high guys, John. Hi guys. Hi guys. Welcome to a uh, high guys. Hi guys. Blah, 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 blah. You know? And so now all these big networks, yeah, they're in this playing field, but it is the people's playing field. It still is. And I think that there are, if there's ever a time for people to get on there, I think people, Right now, even though you have the big the big wigs in there, I, I think that the pandemic kind of, there's something else, there is also something, could you, do you remember how people kind of turned on celebrities at the very beginning of the pandemic when they were like posting these videos, we're in this together and they're hot, and they're in home. <laughs> All this stuff. Right. Yeah. Fans and whatnot. And they're like, we're in this together. We're like, we hate you. <laughs> But oh. there's something about just seeing, you know, people, you know, just going through struggle and just connection. There's something of this need for connection, not false connection, but connection, right? And uh, I don't, I don't, I don't see that going away soon. I think that you know, once you discover a lot of these gems on on these platforms and a lot of these people, you see how special people are and how special art is and and uh, and how and how important community is within each other so uh yeah it's a really interesting it's a really interesting time it's a really interesting it's been an interesting time it is an interesting time and we are on the verge of a huge change you it's, know it's sort of like the trend across multiple genres of our life it's the democratization of entertainment, like the democratization of finances with coin and Doji coin and all these things that are coming like to the people, you know, you give someone a YouTube channel and you give them the opportunity. If you work hard and you put your pedal to the metal and create content that's successful, you could create your own little entertainment empire, you know, and people have. And then they're bought out by you know HBO or something. I would love I would love to know like what Netflix, like they're just who how many people they employ as creatives right now. Just yeah. any in any way, writers, showrunners, whatever the job is. I'd like to know that because it's insane the amount of content being produced. But it's giving people the chance to shine. And I think it's I think it's needed and Awesome. I'm going to make a prediction. So my prediction, I know with uh, Marvel Studios right now, with, you know, Disney that owns everything. Uh, Marvel Studios is such this well-oiled running machine that they have people whose full-time jobs it is, is just to invent weapons, armors, vehicles, things, but it has to have a logic to it and it has to make sense. So they're sitting around out there discovering all these new technology, da, 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 da. 
So that way when new directors, new filmmakers come in and say, hey, check this out, see if this, any of this spins, you know, any ideas. They have a full development team that comes up with fight sequences using all this stuff with pre-visualizations and all this and to make it where this is beautiful fight sequence so they could adapt it and apply it wherever need be and all this kind of stuff. I mean, people's full-time jobs, just go over there and just to create in costumes, different costumes than this. You know, who knows? Maybe sometime down the line, somebody will want a fish world costume with scales and uh, make it, but make it have logic to it, make it work. Your, your job is just to create interesting stuff that will just make people's mind blow, just blown and, and will give you a, enough depth to dive in, swim around and explore as to what this thing is. Mark my words, they're gonna employ, before you know it, they're gonna employ choreographers just to just start choreographing a whole bunch of sequences for the avalanche of, of musicals and, and this kind of stuff that's gonna hit. Cause we have In the Heights coming right now. We have West Side Story coming right now, the, 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 uh, coming soon. The Steven Spielberg's doing West Side Story. And uh, I mean, who knows what's gonna happen from that point on, you know? Uh, who's the guy that did um, the 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 rap musical Lu Louis Louis Miranda? What is his name? A Lin Manuel Miranda. Yes, that, that, that guy seems to be really popular right now. It seems to be getting a lot of work. And Disney is just like, yes, sir. You know, uh, show us the way. Which makes uh, Pima like the fact that all right, people that are watching this have a college city that's accessible. That's you, know, you got film i worked with fashion program for a long time with moda provocateur and they were incredible you have all these resources in your town take advantage of it <laughs> and um i wanted to piggyback on the um what you were saying about your prediction so as a mother of two children and well my son is a huge gamer my daughter is starting to be a gamer as well I really, in this whole virtual, I really predict that education is going to be a lot more, we're going to be, our children are going to be learning in the virtual environment, like these um, virtual reality environments. And so I've been talking to our game, our full-time gaming um, faculty, Brandon, and I'm like, we've got a this is this is happening. Um, and so we're talking about creating dance in the virtual environment. Wow. And he and he was saying, you know, dancers are hired to code and like create um, like these avatars. So like there is a huge I think that this is a huge place for dancers, um, like another area for dancers to consider going into. And um, and so anyways, that's one thing I'm investigating. But yes, we've got like the gaming and film and theater and you know, art at, at Pima. Um, and it's like anybody can be a Pima student, like anybody can take a class. So I, I love Pima. <laughs> it, it's accessible and it provides support. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what a great canvas to create too. Like that theater you all have on West Campus is incredible. And you know, we're, well, I've been so lucky to rent it multiple times and your staff and you and everyone's just so kind. And I've rented probably every major theater in Tucson and you all are the easiest to work with and the kindest Aww. folks. And, um, and, and you don't nickel and dime people. Um, I think, I think you, you should probably charge a little more, but that's okay. I probably shouldn't say that on the podcast, but it's just access again, accessible for someone that, maybe doesn't have a, a full-fledged business to come in and rent it and create spectacular when this pandemic's over. That's so important. It's like, you know, you're, you're going to foster the next Lin-Manuel or someone you've, we have no idea. I have had people come up to me back, you know, Michael, when we first did that Muse event at Flying Wells and we had those mm -hmm. bazillion kids that came and took our classes there was a girl that came up to me recently and said, like, hey, I took a, a class with you at that Muse event. And first I kind of rolled my eyes and I was like, what Muse event? <laughs> I didn't do very many. She's like, no, the one at the high school. You said this and that. I'm like, the fact that you remember teaches me how important it is to one, make it very 
make a, a, a commitment to my words and what I say in class, but also to just get out there and say something because who knows who will who'll latch onto it. I mean, Michael, you've inspired countless me, Jez, there's so many people. So it's just get out there and, and create and inspire because in the, in the vacuum, which is COVID, we need it. Kids need it in, in particular. Um, you know, I, I know how much I miss the social interaction, the people in the community of breakout. You know, it was almost as important after dance cardio, turning around and seeing the people's conversations and community as it was teaching the class. Um, you know, so say something. <laughs> Um, what are, uh, so where's, uh, where's the dance department at like right now? Are, are you guys functioning? Are you guys in studio classes at the moment? Are you guys only doing online stuff? So right now we have, we're just offering ballet and then we have our dance ensemble. Um, and yes, they are, they're in studio, socially distanced, they wear masks, you know, but um, they're, they're able to come to the studio. And then um, hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to offer our, our full um, menu of classes, uh, modern and hip hop and, um, and jazz. We also are, are starting our theater dance class again. And, um, and then in the future, I, I really would like to bring back like tap and, um, and folklotico. We have like a huge folklotico community and um so i'm like why don't we have it at pima we need to have it at pima like and there's really cool things happening in the folklorical community like lots of fusions with like other dance forms and um and i mean we are like we're tucson so <laughs> we should so i definitely want to go down where i'm working with um bruno loya i don't know if you all know him from um from Tucson High. He teaches Folklotico there. He also teaches other places around town, but um, to create a dual enrollment class so that students at um, Tucson High taking, they can take this uh, Folklotico class that's actually considered a Pima class and it's, they will get college credit for that. So we want to set up more of that throughout, like with our high schools that offer dance as well, but we're kind of starting with the folklorico segment so what what is uh what is the uh, dance ensemble exactly so dance ensemble is um it's kind of it's almost like a mini company well it is like a company in a sense so the dancers actually learn choreography but they're also creating choreography um they are they're kind of learning about like how to produce dance so when they when they create choreography they're um, you know, they're working like with the lighting and, um, and w this semester that they, they will be doing, cause we have a small group. So they will be doing a lot more of the marketing and, you know, looking at, you know, like all of the aspects of producing dance. So it's, I would say it's like, kind of, it's like a company, um, a professional company and they are like fulfilling all the roles so not only are they the dancers and the choreographers but they're also the um you know the producers so is that like an audition audition basis do you have to yeah. be a student? like how does somebody well, so they yeah. audition yeah they audition audition to be in it as um like in terms of like who's a pima student if you enroll in a class you're a pima student so if you audition for dance ensemble and you're not currently taking any other classes then you enroll in that class and then you're a pima student so like in you have to be a pima student to be in our productions like of any kind but um but you can get credit for being in the production does that make sense gotcha oh, yeah it does make sense uh before we before we head out here <clears throat> we're talking about dance film and dance and all that stuff I remember you talking about seeing uh, uh, Fame, watching Fame as a kid. The TV, was it the TV show or the movie? It was, yeah, I wasn't allowed to watch the movie. I think it was rated R, but I, it was the TV show. Okay, <laughs> okay. was uh, Debbie Allen, was Debbie Allen doing the, I, uh, was she involved in the series? Yep. Do you remember? 
Okay, I re- okay, and, um, because I remember she was uh, did a lot of uh, directing, uh, television directing, Different World, and and, and a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, favorite? Uh, do you have a favorite musical moment, dance moment in film, television? Um. Oh well, there's there's so many. Um. I. You know, it's funny, and this, I don't know if this is my favorite, but, you know, there was a lot of criticism about the, um, the film Cats. Um, uh. But I actually, I really, I really enjoyed it. I really, I didn't. I, I did. What did you see it, Todd? You know, I did, and I I didn't dislike it. Like, there was such a fervor about it being terrible. I went I actually went to the loft during their event where they gave out the little cat ears and they gave poppers out. And let's just say I had a little cat in it before I went, so I was primed and ready. And there's a costume show, and I loved. I mean, I loved the spectacle of it. Was it the most amazing cinematic experience? No, but it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I don't, I don't know what would be my favorite. Um, I feel like there is, there is a favorite and I just, I don't know what it is. Like it's, you know, I can't think of what it is right now as far as my favorite goes. A, a few, or you can name a couple if you want, just something that stands out to you. Anything like from, for me, I, my go-to is always uh, the opening of the movie Tap where Gregory Hines is in the jail cell. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. And yeah. Pretty much a, a good chunk of it is all just within one frame. Just within one frame, you just see him. You could see both ends of the walls of the jail cell. And then it's just a silhouette right in the middle with the blue background of, you know, the ambience of the, of the, you know, the nighttime prison sequence. And he's tapping and it just keeps crescendoing, crescendoing, crescendoing. I remember that being a very powerful. And then for me personally, I mean, I was a kid in the 80s, a teen in the 90s. So the the dance battle and house party for me was just like, was gold. Uh, uh, of course, you know, the, uh, Paul Abdul's choreography and coming to America was incredible. The the whole um, um, ceremonial dance at the wedding, the Zamunda dance, I remember that being epic. I mean, I could go on and on. I love dance and film. We've talked we, we've talked at length about movement and film. That's what was always wondered. I just wondered if there's anything that that uh, resonated with you. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, it depends. Like some. Um, I mean, what like like early. I think probably one of my first like you know dance and film moments was probably like West Side Story, and um, being you know like seeing that or, or Greece, you know, like things like, and I was a kid in the eighties too. Um, not that West Side Story was, I don't, I can't remember when it was it in the set. I don't remember when it came out, but you know, being able to like try to learn the, the movement, like while I was watching and rewinding it and, you know, um, I don't, I think like some of the, you know, something that I'm, Twyla Tharp was somebody that I really admired when I was, you know, studying dance and like actually like getting my bachelor's and, and she did, you know, she did some, some cool stuff like early on with film. Um, But I think like now, and I don't know really what she's doing now, but I think, you know, there's, there's, there's so much creativity that like we see with some of the European companies like Nederland or what is it? Um, the Netherlands dance theater yeah. or Nederlander dance theater. Like I, that was a group that I really watched a lot when I was at the U of A in grad school and what they were doing. And um, so, I mean, I feel like stuff that I really admire might not be like in the forefront, um, but just like fun, like watching dance, you know, musical theater on, you know, like, uh, like on the big screen is always just, you know, you want to get up and dance. And there's like a lot, like, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know what my favorite is. It's a good question. <laughs> I'll have to think about it and get back to you. What about you, Todd? Got, you got a, a dance moment to throw out there? This is so random. 
yeah it's what it's what popped to my head as we were talking about this that tango duo between uh cameron diaz and jim carrey in the mask <laughs> Like what a brief, ridiculous piece of choreography, but I, that's just. But it shows you how many movies have those quick little bits. Maybe it's not a huge Chicago, you know. It's a it's a main character of the film, but they use it for Moments levity, get- comedy relief, connector, uh, uh, character building, and connection. <laughs> that's what I was thinking of. Is when. Whenever he dips her, he takes the rose out of his, her mouth. And... <laughs> Random. So that's what I was thinking about, about my cinematic <laughs> inspiration. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Never, you know, he didn't dance. Again, Paul Abdul did that as well, too. She choreographed that whole deal. He didn't know. Can't, how to... can't Buy Me Love, did you say? Yeah, Can't Buy Me Love. Is that the one that was filmed at Tucson High? Yeah. It's this, little, this uh, 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 Patrick, what's his name? Something Patrick, Patrick. Uh, Dempsey. Dempsey. Okay, Patrick Dempsey is this little nerd and uh, who makes a trade with a girl to pretend like she's his girlfriend so he could become popular. He does become popular. So there's all these expectations, one of which is he's going to a dance with a, a new pretty girl and she's excited to see his, his sexy dance moves. And he's like, oh no, my sexy dance moves I, he has nothing he's you know he's a nerd he's a little nerd <sighs> dragons with his friends so he goes and turns on america he thinks he's turning on american bandstand this is in the 80s but is watching this natural but instead it's this national geographic uh, uh uh thing showing this this uh, african ant eating ritual ceremony thing or something uh, something like that so he starts learning this dance and and then he goes to the dance at the high school and once he gets out to the dance he just closes his eyes and just crosses his finger and starts starts doing this crazy dance and stuff and all this and he just keeps his eyes closed he just keeps going and going and everybody's looking at him at first like what is happening but this is the new popular person right before you know it the entire auditorium's doing this whole dance in his eyes and it's just like this whole frenzy but it's a, it's such a fun moment you know it's such a fun moment it's it's a I hope we don't lose, especially after the pandemic, there's just something really fun about watching dance on film at such a large scale, whether it's an auditorium full of kids doing this, this dance, you know, with this one little guy, or whether it's on Ferris Bueller's day off at the parade and you just see these hundreds of people dancing together, you know, or the blue, oh my God, the blues brothers, you know, all the- Do you see uh, prom? On Netflix, did you see Prom? I've not seen the prom. new huge dance numbers. Huge. I mean, they're not only sort of high school musical esque, because that's another uh, what's his name, who Ryan Murphy movie. Um, but there are a few even bar scenes in New York on like Broadway, where they have these great breakout numbers, and it's it's good. It's like kind of a throwback to like old. Uh, movie musicals. It's a really great, uh, especially for your family. It's, it's I'm, I'm plugging it. It's really cute. Yeah, movie to watch. Don't need to get too too far off topic there. It's got me excited with all. <laughs> it's all on topic. It's all about arts and dance and love and light and survival. Yes. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> specific before we start wrapping up well i you know i think this is just a really great conversation and again anything that comes up leanne about pima or what you're doing about your shows about uh whatever let us know so we can keep talking about it and posting about it and um i think it's very important and we're going to lend whatever resources we have to continue this conversation so anything else you want to say before we wrap this up yeah i um no be keep um i will definitely keep you posted i think um the people that are watching this definitely keep an eye out we will be releasing um a couple different things like a few different things hopefully a lot of things maybe weekly um on our pima arts facebook channel or youtube channel 
And um, we actually have one of our students is um, one of like a, also a breakout student, one of our dance ensemble members, Eva Schmidt. So I'm really mm. super excited. And she's actually still, she's a senior in high school. And so I'm, um, I hope it's okay that I just said her name. Um, <laughs> As long as she's okay with it, we're okay. With it. Okay, I'll ask her. Um, <laughs> but she, yeah, so she's, um, we're super excited to see, I mean, she's like an up and coming dancer and, and to see, you know, like what she's, what she's got. So, um, yeah, so just keep an eye out. We're, we, it's, it's, it's all a surprise, even to me, like what's, you know, what's, what's up and coming, but we're definitely going to be out there sharing our stuff, so. Fantastic. Awesome. Yay. Yay. All right. Well, thank you very much for hanging out. Uh, yes. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks. I don't know if we have any plans or any announcements we're making as of yet, but, you know, stay tuned. Very soon we'll have some announcements. Uh, thank you both. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. This is great. We need to have it. We need to have a separate podcast to talk about dance and psychology yeah we'll talk about that too <laughs> awesome well thank you very much well, for breakout studios i am michael montoya and i am todd wilson and another huge thank you to leanne sotomayor life moves move with it have a good one okay bye Six, seven, and hop!